Hello, believers. Welcome to the Just Praise Him radio show. I'm your host, Glenda Lomax, and I don't have a title for my message today, but what we're going to talk about is finding out what your calling is and answering your call. Um, I get a lot of questions about this and a lot of emails from people who don't understand how to figure out what their calling is. And I had to pray about this for a while because the Lord actually just kind of talks to me and and just tells me whatever I'm supposed to do. And, And I rely so much on that, I never thought about having to find it out some other way. So first I want to talk for a minute about fighting your calling. Uh, people fight their callings for various reasons. One of the reasons is um, they don't want to have to leave their family or friends or live someplace else, you know, or do anything like that, and they're afraid their calling might require that. Sometimes your calling does require that. Not always, but sometimes. Uh, my calling happens to require that God, you know, I just let God move me wherever he wants to move me for whatever reason. Um The famous story of Jonah in the Bible is the prime example of fighting your calling. Um, Jonah, (laughs) God told him to go to Nineveh and he didn't want to go. God told him to go to Nineveh and and preach repentance and he did not want to go. And the story was told, and I heard this in somewhere in a sermon or maybe Nicole told me about it. I'm not sure. Somebody told me. That in Nineveh, Nineveh had undergone a lot of judgments and a lot of bad things had happened there. So maybe Jonah didn't want to go because he didn't want to get caught in a judgment. I don't know. But anyway, he didn't want to go. And so he took a ship to somewhere else trying to run from God. And the whale swallowed him up. He got thrown overboard and the whale swallowed him up. And he was three days in the belly of the whale, which means he was dead. He was not alive down there. He was dead. There wasn't enough oxygen for him to survive in there. So then the whale spits him out. And God revives him, and he goes, okay, I guess I'll go to Nineveh. And he went. And he preached repentance, and the people actually, you know, repented. So bad things can happen to us if we fight the calling. We don't want to fight the calling. Uh, What gave me the idea to do this message this week is I was reading in my devotional, and I read something I had never noticed what was in here before. Uh, It's in Haggai chapter 1. And, you know, Haggai is not a book you normally turn to to just read for being reading. But... Uh, It was the second year of Darius the king, and the Lord wanted the temple rebuilt. So, thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be rebuilt. Then came the word of, of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you? O ye to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lies waste. In other words, you're taking care of your house, and my house is just going to waste. Is it that time? And now, therefore, saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. I found this part very interesting. Ye have sown much, and bring in little. Ye eat, but you have not enough. Ye drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put into a bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. You looked for much, and lo, it came to little, and when you brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts, because of my house that is waste, and you run every man into his own house. Therefore, the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. So what he's saying is, because you didn't do what you're not doing, what I want you to do, you're not being blessed. And I never noticed those, you know, I read the Bible every year, but I never noticed those passages were addressing that particular thing. So anyway, the people did go and build the temple, and he blessed them. I think the bottom line to this is, if you find your calling and enter into your calling, you'll have challenges. We're going to have challenges whether we answer our calling or not, but we'll have challenges without blessing. On top of that, if we don't answer our calling, if we do answer our calling, sorry, y'all, my chihuahuas are taking the UPS man to task, I'm sure. Um, If you answer your calling, there's great peace in your life, and God blesses you. He blesses you because you're working for him. You're doing his work, okay? And, you know, like he said, is it time for you to sit in your house and and my house layeth waste? 
There was another verse I wanted to read you on chapter 2. Let me find this real quick. What's he's, what he's talking about in chapter 2 is he's talking about building my house, building his house. When you answer your calling, you are building his house because his house is his kingdom on earth, okay? It's his his people, his family on earth. That's, that's our house, right? Our family, where we live, all that, that's our house. So if you participate in your calling, you're helping to build God's house. So Haggai chapter 1 and chapter 2 apply to you. Okay, now let's talk about finding your calling. Everybody is called to do something, okay? Um, there's a lot of different callings. We probably need to talk about those a little bit. And I've told you all time and again to try to find your calling. One of the things you can do is take the spiritual gifts test online. Uh, I don't know that you can take them free anymore. You, there may still be a, a site where you can take them for free. And I wish that I had that on my site, but I don't know how to get anything like that on my site. But that would be good if we had that. Um, if you take the spiritual gifts test, what it tells you is what you're gifted for. So what your aptitude is for. What gifts that the Lord has placed in you. The gifts that he has placed in you will basically tell you what your calling is. Obviously, if he's gifted you to be a pastor then at some point, he intends to use you as a pastor. In um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it talks about the gifts of the Spirit. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. The word of wisdom is uh, not the one I'm thinking about. To another, the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. The word of knowledge is like, if I see you on the street and the Lord tells me, uh, you know, this person has four children, one of their children is sick, you know, blah, blah, blah. That's in, and he tells me that, and I speak that to you, that's a word of, of knowledge. That's a, a knowledge that I could have known no other way. Okay. And that very often will precede prophecy to another faith by the same spirit. There is all of us as believers have faith to some degree. You know, we have faith to believe for our salvation, obviously, which is a great a great thing because salvation is the greatest miracle but a gift of faith is like uh, if you have faith to build a 10 million dollar church and that comes real easy to you and then the faith you know you know God answers that and you build a 10 million dollar church that's a gift of faith I would have trouble believing for a 10 million dollar church so I don't have that gift of faith for that um, I have a gift of faith to do what I do uh, and not work a job, but to do this ministry all the time. I have that level of a gift of faith. But there is a gift of faith for real big, huge things, and that's a, a true gift of faith. To another, the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. If it's fairly common for you to, like, lay hands on somebody and pray for them to be healed and they're healed, then you may be operating in that gift of healing. To another, the working of miracles. Now, miracles are different from healing like a miracle would be let's say somebody's had a leg amputated and you pray for them and that leg grows back that's a miracle uh somebody's died you lay hands on them and you pray for them and they come back their spirit comes back into their body that's a miracle that's not a healing that's a miracle that's a different thing to another prophecy prophecy is you know knowing the things that are coming in the future or in my case knowing what the trends the trends are, I get more trends than future events. I get, um, I call them trends. Uh, somebody told me once I was kind of like, I kind of like had my finger on the pulse of the body of Christ. But I think I just have it on the group that the Lord has called to follow the JPH website. I don't know if it's the whole body, but. Uh, to another discerning of spirits. Discerning of spirits is. Let's say you walk into a house and in this particular room, you discern there's a demon there. And some people with discernment can see the demons, uh, know why the demons are there, etc. like that. If you have a discerning of spirits gift, you're probably called a spiritual warfare. Uh, to another, diverse kinds of tongues. My friend John Morgan, who just passed away, went home to heaven, had a diverse 
tongues, diverse tongues. Every time he prayed in tongues, it would come out in a different language. I've heard him pray in Vietnamese. Um, I'm pretty sure I heard him pray in Chinese once. I mean, just all these different. And you think, well, what would that be useful for? Well, let me tell you. Let's say that let's say that someone with a gift of diverse tongues, let's say that I have that gift and I'm in a church and I go down to the altar to pray and I'm praying and the person next to me is a person, let's say they're, they're Chinese and the Lord speaks to them through the tongues that I'm praying. He speaks directly to them. I've read stories about this. Y'all they're the coolest stories ever. I would love to have that gift. He uses that gift that way. You're praying to God in your heart or you're praying for somebody, but God's speaking to the person sitting by you or standing by you that understands that language perfectly. And the last story I read about that, uh, the person that he spoke to was like a person from China or Japan or somewhere like that. And he spoke to them, you know, that he was the one true God. They needed to give their life to him and whatever, and address them in their formal temple name. I think they called it a formal temple name. So I was like, that's really cool. So that's what that gift is. And the interpretation of tongues. That's if you're in uh, a church, someone speaks a message in tongues out loud, and God all of a sudden gives you what, what, the, what it means, but in English. And then you speak the interpretation out loud. All of those are gifts given from God's Spirit that um, are used for the body of Christ, are used to build the kingdom of God, to build his house. Okay, those are the spiritual gifts. Now, those give you a clue what you're called to do. Um, I need to find, and I didn't find, uh, the scripture that talks about he gave some apostles and teachers and all that. Let me see if I can find it real quick for y'all. Thank God for the internet and Bible Gateway. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So we all come in the unity of the faith. Okay. Apostles is, apostle is, I was told apostle is somebody who has a little bit of a whole bunch of gifts that, and apostles are people that are sent, like the disciples were sent. And some prophets, prophets are, I don't know how to describe prophets. And some evangelists, evangelists mainly win souls to the kingdom. They help people pray, you know, the prayer of salvation and things. Pastors, pastor churches, those are shepherds. And teachers um, teach the Bible and teach people how to, you know, walk in the walk the way they're supposed to walk in the walk. Okay, so think about if you have ever evidenced any of those spiritual gifts, because that's one of your clues to what your calling is. If you, uh, I have no gift of being a pastor. If you gave me a church, I wouldn't really know what to do with it, probably. Um, it, other than I like to teach. I love to teach. Um, but there are people that they want to pastor churches. You know, they want that little flock and they want to shepherd that flock and teach them and, and take care of them. If you can find an online gifts test, take it. If you can't, just think about these gifts and whether you've ever seen any of these gifts at work in you or anyone has ever told you that you have these gifts. If you go to church, your pastor may have noticed what your giftings are. Uh, if you have a mentor, a mentor may have noticed what your giftings are. Uh, some, sometimes the Lord will speak to you prophetically through someone what your giftings are. Another thing to look at is your natural tendencies. Uh, do you love to be in a big group of people all the time, or do you really kind of like to be alone? Um, do you love to read and study? Uh, do you love to teach? Do you love to pray? Uh, there are people that are called to intercession, and that's their job. Full-time, that's what they do. I know people like this. Their whole calling is inter intercession. They are either praying all the time, or they're teaching other people how to intercede. Uh, and that's awesome because God needs intercessors. Intercession is very, very close to God's heart. Uh, people who like to pray a lot and can pray for like an hour without even trying or pray for two or three hours, those are intercessors. People that 
uh, let's say that uh, you're watching the hurricane coverage on television and because we've had a lot of that this year and let's say all of a sudden you just have this burden this heaviness on you to pray for those people or um, someone emailed me the other day and said and this broke my heart and said that the Lord had spoken to them um, I think it was my friend John S that the Lord had spoken to him that every minute somebody slipped into hell without knowing him and it broke my heart to read that email and know that every minute there's a lot of minutes in a day y'all there's a lot of minutes in a day I don't know how many but it's a lot so at least once every 60 seconds somebody is drug off to hell by the demons God needs intercessors for that. He needs intercessors, and then he can send evangelists. If somebody will pray for the lost, then God has can reach down and, and work in that situation and send someone across that person's path to lead them to him. Okay? So intercessors will often feel that heaviness, a burden, like they're carrying a great weight. And then once they go and they pray for a while or for hours or whatever over that situation, then that burden lifts a little bit. Sometimes it don't lift for a while because God wants us to keep on praying. My mother was an intercessor. There are people who are called to just intercede, to pray all the time. They're either praying or they're training other people how to do it. Okay, um, do you love to encourage people? Do you love to sing or play music? Um, you may be called to be on the worship team or be a worship leader. There are, I have actually known people that were actually, the main part of their calling was to work and make money and fund the kingdom through other people. You know, they work and make money and they help people plant churches by, by paying for, you know, doing the money part of it. They're given to the fund. The people are going out there and doing the churches or they're paying for missionaries to go to, you know, third world countries and tell people about Jesus. But their part of it is to make the money and pay for it. Okay. I don't know what that's called, but I've seen people that that was the main part of their calling. Or maybe it was just that their personality, they couldn't be used for anything else. I don't know. I always, from the time I was 12 years old, wanted to write. And I have always loved to train people or teach people. Um, a guy came up to me back in the early 2000s, late 90s or early 2000s. I think I was doing a job and I was in Woodward for one day. The Woodward, Oklahoma courthouse, I think is where I was at. It was someplace anyway in Oklahoma. And this guy that I knew, an, another landman that I saw from time to time at other courthouses, came up to me and he said, and I was showing somebody how to do something. <clears throat> and he said, he, I had known him when I was on the crew. He had come and done some work for our, our crew job and. He said, every job I see you on, you're a trainer. You're always training somebody. And I said, yeah, I, I like to train. And somehow every job I'm in, I end up training. I ended up being a trainer. He said, you're a trainer every job you go to. And he was right. And what it was, was God had anointed me to teach. And that anointing was so strong in me that even when I was not saved, I wanted to do that. So your natural tendencies, the things you want to do, the things that you wanted to do even before you were saved are a clue to what your calling is. Uh, people who are called to teach often like to spend a lot of time in solitude. The reason is because they drag all their study books out and they're looking up things in their reference books and, and you know making notes and writing sermons and stuff. I could not be around a lot of people all the time. I couldn't do what I do. In fact, I was praying one day, I was in Princeton, and I was praying one day and telling the Lord, I said, Lord, I miss my family. I really miss my family, and I'm really lonely here. I lived in Princeton for eight years and did not have a single Christian friend in that town, other than the, the older lady that I went to see for a month or two that complained all the time. I did not have any Christian friends there, and it was really lonely, y'all. It was really lonely. It was really lonely. And, and, that close to a big city like Dallas, people are not warm and friendly. Here in Arkansas, they're real warm and friendly. You can go walk down the road and make three friends. But down there, it's not like that. If you go around there saying hi to people, they think you're, they think you're messed up. They want to call the, the men in the white coats to come and get you. Um, but I always loved teaching. I always loved encouraging. And I always wanted to write. Guess what? Everything that I wanted to do then, everything I liked to do even before I was saved, turned out to be gifts that God wanted to use now. 
those were clues, although I didn't know it then. They were clues to what I would eventually be doing. Do not be concerned about titles. Titles mean nothing. They mean nothing. I, I've so, seen so many people that tack on apostle, prophet, bishop, whatever to their name. What? Jesus made himself of no reputation. If he made himself of no reputation, we need to make ourselves of no reputation too. Um, in Philippians chapter 2, but, he, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. If Jesus made himself of no reputation, then reputation is not important. Those titles do nothing but lead you to pride. I talked to a woman once who said, well, I'm glorifying God with my, I said, no, you're not. You're glorified in yourself. If you tack t titles on your name, you are glorifying yourself, not God. God will glorify himself through the fruit from your life. Those titles bear no fruit except to make you puffed up. Okay? So, leave off the titles and forget about the titles because they're not important. If you have a gift, you should never, ever, ever, ever need to tell anyone the gift that is in you. Because that gift should be so evident in your life that it announces itself. And if it don't, then you sure don't need to be telling anybody you have it. I'm just saying, y'all. Okay, if you still don't know what your calling is, there are several things that you can still do, and you can just use these as your calling until God shows you what your calling is. You can pray for people, especially the lost, because there are so many people, y'all, that are lost, that are in families who don't have a single Christian person to pray for them. I wouldn't have made it to the kingdom if I hadn't had people praying for me. My mother prayed me into the kingdom, but my sisters helped her. Especially my sister Judy that's gone on home to the Lord. You can pray for the lost. Um, you can witness to people that what Jesus did in your life, you know, and tell them that he can do that for them too. You can support other ministries with your tithe and offering. And you can encourage people. So that's four things that you can do. Even if you don't know what your calling is, you can pray for the lost. You can support your local ministry, like your local church or whatever, through your tithe and offering to help them keep going. It's because they're doing their calling. You can witness to people about Jesus, and you can encourage people. Okay? Oh, and there's a fifth thing, too. If you have different kind of talents, let's say you know how to remodel or something like that, offer your talents to the ministries in your area and say, hey, I'll, if y'all have a project, I'll come help you for two hours on Saturday, you know, or something like that. And give your gifts into the kingdom, because in doing that, that's an offering to the Lord of another type. Serving is a form of worship, okay? If you are serving in God's house, that is a form of worship, and he accepts that, and he blesses you for it, all right? He will bless you for that. I hope this will help y'all to figure out what your callings are and help you to um, get out of the boat. You know, it's all hands on deck. We're in the end of the end times. We need all hands on deck. You need to be doing your calling. You don't want to live a life of no blessing because you're not doing what God's called you to do or you're not doing anything. If you don't know what your calling is, at least do something. I just told you five things that you can do. So I just pray that all of you will find your calling and step into your calling. Because I want y'all to be blessed. I want y'all to be really, really blessed and really happy and really at peace. And no matter how many kids you have, you, if you have a spouse, whatever you have, you can do something. Uh, if you don't do anything else, pray for the lost during your commute. All the way to work, pray for the lost. Do that. Pray for ministries in your area. Pray for the lost. Um, support, you know, your local your local churches and tithes with your tithes and offerings and stuff your ministries around wherever you live you can do something if you don't know what your calling is do something don't do nothing i guess is what i'm saying don't just sit there and do nothing i hope that this message has been a blessing to y'all and i hope it will help you and that you will step into having a really blessed life because this is really a key to that y'all i promise you it's a key um it is awesome to wake up every day at peace and feel so blessed. It really is. But thanks for listening. Jesus bless you. I hope you have a great week.